Entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people won't, so that you can spend the rest of your life like most people can't. My name is Ashkan Karbis Rushan, founder and CEO of Watch Mojo, and in this interview series, we sit down and talk to the men and women who stand in the arena and discuss the struggles, setbacks, and eventual successes they experience as entrepreneurs. In my many years running Watch Mojo, I've spent more time in New York than in any other city, making friends with some of the most talented hustlers and builders in town. While New York City growing to the capital of finance and media by the late 20th century, home to some of the world's largest corporations, the city has also served home to some of the greatest entrepreneurs the world's ever known. Indeed, in the 21st century, in the wake of back-to-back -back shocks of the financial world, Manhattan has seen a slow but steady shift back to its entrepreneurial roots, showcasing the vision, drive, execution, and persistence required to succeed. I must have taken thousands of meetings and my many pilgrimages to the city, but one of the people I most enjoyed catching up with was Rich Antoniello, CEO of Complex Media. I first met Rich back in June 2010. Over the ensuing years, Rich and I discussed various possible partnerships, something we touch on in this interview. He eventually brought on Hearst and Verizon as investors, we turned a profit and remained independent, and then in 2016, those two giants made him an offer he couldn't refuse. To this day, when I have something I want to ask regarding business or life, he's one of the first people I turn to. So Rich, thanks for joining us. Thank um, you, sir. Good to see man. you. Always. How are things since you uh, decided to exit and sell to Verizon? Well, we didn't Hearst. exit. What we've done is um, we took on different strategic partners. That's the way, and it's not just positioning and spin, but you know we were venture backed previously, and for us, we did have a financial exit for our investors and for our management team. But um, you know, and I've always said this: it wasn't an exit; it was an entrance, right? We the, instead of going out and raising more capital, what we decided to do was bring on and allow ourselves to get purchased by strategic partners that believed in the long-term vision of the company and wanted to continue to fund it. But instead of funding it as an investor, funding it as an owner. Now, when you first described it to me, you said by doing that deal, you took winter off the table. That's right. Which I loved. Good I, memory, by the way. I have a very good memory. So. Nowadays, you're seeing winter. You're seeing a lot of these companies. Oh, it's been winter for a while. A lot of people didn't realize they were outside without a jacket on. That's all. <laughs> Is there any sense of like vindication? Do you, or do you care about that stuff? I could care less, to be honest. Um, one of the reasons I was very public about saying all of that wasn't just to you, it was to a lot of people, is because I was trying to, like, I, I believe we're very good at seeing the future um, and, and being very predictive and, and hedging your bets. Um, we've done that both on a tactical level as well as high level strategy. And um, I wanted everybody to kind of think and realize, like, I think, I don't know if you remember the terminology that I, the little uh, explanation I used is, you, you know, media, there were 5,000 companies playing musical chairs and there were five chairs. And two, two of those chairs got together and made an unbelievable offer with a big cushy cushion on it for us and said, you know, we believe in your vision, like, do you want to take your chair now? And the music had stopped. Nobody heard this music stop. We had heard the music stop and we had a perfect chair and we didn't have to fight anybody for it. How did the dynamics change? Because you did have a board, you know, Mark was a- We still have a board. You still have a board, but how did they change? Because before you were maybe with, you know, financial institutional That's investors right. that want to maybe grow the value at any cost. Now you are part of these two, you know, empires. Is there like politics of that, is it just a different kind of politics? Or? It's, it's very different in that, um, but you have to remember something. When we were, um, we didn't just sell the company and then now, okay, Verizon and Hearst got together and decided what our future was going to be. And then we had to fit into their uh, individual plays. That's the advantage of a JV. They got together to invest to get together to use us as an operational platform from a youth culture media perspective because they believed in our vision. And like I said, what we really did is just replace investors with owners. So, uh, you know, I, and I'm not I'm not trying to knock wood, but I mean, on a relative basis, to say that we have a better situation than most, um, it's because I go out of my way always to make sure that. If we're going to get into a situation with somebody, we're crystal clear about what our short, mid, and long-term range plans are. And you have to buy into those in order for us to agree to work with you. You talk about long-term plans. Take me back to the moment. How did you come into the role as CEO of Complex? How did that come to be? Um, uh, very reluctantly, to be frank. Um, 
you know, uh, they they had just launched the magazine. This was 2002, May of 2002. And uh, I had met Mark uh, Echo and Seth Gersberg. And, uh, and I loved the concept of what they were doing. I don't know if you remember the first issue was Uncle, Na, uh, uh, Uncle Junior and Nas on one side and Rosario Dawson in a schoolgirl outfit on the other. And it was half buyer's guide and half content. And, and, and it was basically, um, all of this will sound very duh now, but it was, uh, in my viewpoint, this culmination of kind of convergence culture well ahead of, of anybody else. And they had a good concept um, but it wasn't very evident in the execution, uh, both from a quality perspective or kind of coming through on that vision. And I had an opportunity to meet those guys. Um, we didn't have as eloquent of a conversation as that. It was more of yelling and screaming at each other about what was right and what was wrong. And uh, I had a three and a half hour meeting with Seth Gersberg, um, and we just screamed at each other about you know things. And he was like, okay, and shows up at my apartment the next day and goes, listen, uh, I loved everything you had to say, uh, and we don't know how to fix anything or how to do this right, so why don't you come on and do it for us? And uh, I'm like, okay. I had previously been a revenue guy, right? And uh, But I had very um, strong opinions, shocking, about content, business overall, and the space. And um, so what we really did is, uh, that was, that was uh, I came on in January of 2003, um, within three and a half years, we broke even with the magazine, which uh, you, I don't know if you know much about publishing, but other than you don't want to be in that business, um, and which was unbelievable. We used the leverage of the Echo brand, a lot of the retail locations, the actual merchandise itself with hang tags and other things like that, which took a lot of cost structure out of us. You know, I got to learn a lot about myself in kind of throwing yourself in the deep end and figuring things out, right? I, I was a reluctant entrepreneur and a reluctant CEO, really. Uh, I wanted to drive the business forward and make more revenue, but then you start to realize it's not, it's not every dollar is the same color, not every dollar has the same contribution. What's, what's the right balance of short and long term? What's the right balance of qualitative and quantitative? What's the right balance of positioning um, and where the real value is, is uh, what's the difference between enterprise value and other, you know, there's, there's so many things and, and I got to learn kind of on the job and I threw myself in the deep end uh, in the dark uh, in a straitjacket and figured it out. Today, magazines and print is the whipping boy, so there's no need to discuss <laughs> that. I can it's imagine. been a whipping boy for me for a long time, though. I can imagine, but it probably gave you guys a lot of cachet. I want to talk about another form of media, which is television. Where do you see that? Is television where magazines were, or are they somewhat going to be safe? Oh, well, first of all, you have, there's a big difference between network and, and cable as well, right? The, the business models are completely different mm -hmm. as well. So you have to make a delineation there. Um, you do have to realize, you know, everybody, nobody is arguing over the power of video. That's the height of irony, right? So they want to criticize television, but everybody's trying to get into that business. It's, 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 you know, people talking out of both sides of their mouth, does that ever happen, right? Um, but I look at a television and I believe if they are willing to be, um, to lean into the next generation and provide super high quality programming, they will get viewership. Now they will get viewership probably in a very different distribution way and they have to open up their business to, to be not so rigid about one place where everybody has to come to view that content. But I mean, there's proof points all around. Look at a show like Game of Thrones and look at what, how rabid those fans are and look at how many subscriptions that drives for HBO. Look at shows like The Walking Dead, maybe not so now, but previously. Um, Breaking Bad, you know, you can go on and on and on, and now Insecure and other shows like that. Now, um, not all of those are uh, paid cable, are, are on paid channels, but a lot of those are on regular cable, and a lot of them, there's still a lot of shows on network that drive big audiences that people are very loyal to. And I, 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 I am not ready to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's still too many dollars that go there, and there's still too much scale that actually appears uh, on all of those opportunities. I do believe that the content producers of tomorrow's content for those outlets uh, are vastly changing. And that's where I believe, um, instead of looking at small production companies and, um, you know, kind of uh, the small batch of people that, you know, do very formulaic, 
here's the here's the um, uh, a reboot of the same sitcom. Here's the reboot reboot of the same hour long drama. Those days are gone. And I think what you're going to see is you need to go to companies that not only have the chops to produce very uh, intriguing and differentiated original content, but have the, a, a platform and an audience that they can point to it as well and market it in a very organic way. So That sounded very self-serving, but tell no, me what's wrong no, with that I, as a no, theory. It's, it's all good. It's actually very realistic. And I think you're right about the speaking on two sides. Everybody's pooping on TV, but they're trying to become that. Okay. So you mentioned video, and you guys had to think long and hard before you really went into video. And the easy thing to have done was to look at the BuzzFeed, possibly even a watch Montreal, and see what others are doing and copy and that. And chase. Yeah, we but you didn't do we that. We don't chase. Take me through that process, because you guys really listened to your inner voice, and you came out with something that was on the Super Bowl, if you think about it. Before. That's right. So, I mean, just, I want to go from it's concept kind of mind to reality. It's kind of isn't it? I, when I saw that, I got goosebumps. I was that's, like, that's, that's rich. That's so right. take us through concept to reality. So, uh, you know, when we first went into this whole thing, it was very important for us. Notice, I keep using words like, I use unfair advantages, differentiation, um, and brand a lot. We've always talked about that brand, how important that is. And, and that is the differentiation that makes your audience premium. Um, brand quality makes your, your scale premium because in this day and age, scale for scale purposes is just an arbitrage game and it's just a commodity. And, and it's being commoditized across the board on programmatic no matter what platform you're on. So that is not the way we want to get purchased. Now, to, to how that correlates back. So if I knew that, you know, Whatever uh, monetization that we've always had, it's only a matter of time before it gets commoditized. So what you want to do is how do you bring the most premium conversation and relationship with the end user? So the deeper it is, and I'm going to give you something that you've probably heard me say 50 times over the 10 years yeah, that we've yeah, known each other. Yeah, about 10 years, yeah is the deeper the connection with the end consumer, the easier it is to insert an advertiser in without and, and having it make sense and be effective. If you have a dotted line uh, relationship with a whole bunch of consumers, you have no place to put the advertiser relationship within that. Very simple concept, shocking, right? But so what we've always been about is how do you ha develop franchises and brands? The same way we had Complex and First We Feast in these sites, we look at like what the new version of sites are because sites are going to be tomorrow, uh, yesterday, is those are now series and franchises that are video oriented that can go across multiple platforms. They can appear in different ways on social platforms. Those are the websites of today. Those are the blogs and the vlogs, right? And, and again, again, probably it sounds duh now, but that's been, that was our philosophy in 2012 when we went into this. And it took us a long time to build franchises, right? But you know, you referenced Hot Ones as a perfect case example, appearing on the pregame show of the Super Bowl. NBC reaching out to go, we want you to produce a show that to appear on the Super Bowl because you have took a digital property that made so much impact and has so much audience and is not a over-the-head view of hands and pans bullshit content that's 30 seconds long. No, no. What are you referencing? No by shots the way. to people, no, right? No, no. no. I mean, but I mean, what value is that? There's no library value to that. There's no long-term real value. It's a whole bunch of view counts that are really optics-based. In my viewpoint, I'd rather have a real deep connection that somebody mean that something means to the end consumer, and they're searching out our content. What we've always done is create pull-oriented content, not push. And I think there's a lot of people in the digital space that concentrate on push. Our philosophy from a video perspective is how do we create the same connection that our sites have? How do we transition that connection to video series? So we went and, and always invested in longer form. We have the view counts um, on an optics basis that a lot of people have our 1.2 billion video views a month. Disproportionately, a lot of ours are owned and operated in YouTube versus Facebook. Thank God. Um, but 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 we have those view counts and the scale of a lot of other competitors from a digital perspective, but most of their content is 30 to 45 seconds long. Our average content is 18 minutes and 43 seconds long with completion rates over 78%. The, the amount of minutes that people are consuming and the, the meaningful nature of that and the fact that Hot Ones comes out or sneaker shopping comes out and in a seven day queue, and I'm gonna use television speak, is in a seven day queue, they will, they will get anywhere between five and 15 million views in the first seven days. There's not a cable program in the world that is getting that, that level of that. So if you really think about what we've built is, we've built a, 
a, a linear cable channel that happens right now to be disproportionately distributed on digital, not a digital publisher who's trying to find homes and panicking. We had a real long-term strategy, built out this linear cable channel that is very verticalized around all of the passion points that we own, and now we're thinking about distribution on, and from, a, from a strength and a leverage perspective because of the size of the audience. Sneaker shopping went one for one. It's usually about 11 minutes long. We put two of them together and they are now broadcast after Nick games on MSG. The Fuse relationship where we have a bl an hour and a half block on Fuse. A lot of that is content that is already being produced. Hot Ones, Sneaker Shopping, Life at Complex, those are amalgamations. That is digital content that doesn't need to be repackaged, re-edit, built, and built differently for TV. All of our content is built for every platform on a premium nature from, from day one. And that's a very differentiated approach. Yeah, and it's the right approach. And you just, it's almost like hearing myself, you know, watch time and all that. We don't do 18 minutes. That's us, it's six minute average, and the average well, clip you, is 10 you have, minutes. You, you have currently a very different, you, your distribution is not as diverse as ours yet. Yet. That will change as you, as you change. Those, that length will change. Yeah, Believe well, me, it has to. It has to, no, absolutely. You gotta change and innovate, otherwise you die. So you, you mentioned the word reluctant entrepreneur, which is how I've described myself. So tell me, what does that word mean to you? When was the first time you heard the word entrepreneur? I mean, you know what? That's funny. I didn't hear it a lot growing up. Not not where I not where I came from, and not even from a um, a college perspective. Um, you know, that was that was an aberration of aberrations when I, when I was coming up, and it was more about uh, getting a big opportunity, never building your own business. That was just not in the vernacular. I wasn't exposed to a lot of people like that. And then when I got the opportunity to run my own thing and really kind of go for it, um, I will tell you. Um, I might have been reluctant going into it, but uh, to say I embraced it and got excited about it was uh, the understatement of the year. And, and what's interesting, I'm so jealous of this generation because the, 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 the breadth of entrepreneurship, both from an opportunity perspective and an exposure perspective and knowing these stories, both traditional and non-traditional, and we do a great job telling the non-traditional entrepreneur story, I, I would have killed for that. Because if I was, 18, 16, 18, 21 years old and would have had that opportunity, I might not have waited till 30 years old to take my shot. I mean, look at Mark Zuckerberg as the leading example now, but times have changed. Do you think, I mean, you guys being youth culture, you, you have your finger on the pulse. Do you feel this generation is getting an unfair rep? Or is it, you know, well, like... From, you from what standpoint? Well, like generally that millennials are lazy or like they don't work hard. And is that kind of like, is that... I what? think they work differently. You know, that, that a lot of the criticism is coming from a generation that was about FaceTime and card punching, right? Like hours at the office and other things like that. Um, you know, they, they work differently. They dress differently. It's not as formal. The, the, office, the office hours, like I'm not a FaceTime guy. Like I'm not worried. If somebody's in the office three hours a day, but they're absolutely killing it because their job and, they, and they're working on social 24 seven and, and positioning things right and building revenue and, 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 and or eyeballs or audience. Um, I'm good with that, right? And I think uh, the, the, you always get criticisms and finger pointing when there's, when there's um, genre clashes, right? And I think, uh, I, I believe a lot of it is honestly jealousy because I do wish you know, I don't know if you remember your first jobs, but you know, when I first started at Saatchi when I was 21 years old, um, it, was a, it was a clock punch uh, and a FaceTime job. I wish that wasn't the case. I mean, if I had a chance to start over and I could be in the office and come in later and leave early, but like get my job done, it's just we had to be there in order to actually work because we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have Wi-Fi, we didn't have those things. And I think a lot of that is, um, it's unfair, because I think these kids work more than anybody else, really. I think they're connected more. And what is also defined as work, uh, the, the, the line, because of the nature of being connected 24 seven is blurred. So even when they're not doing 100% of work because they're not staring at a screen, how much of networking and who they party with and, and the conversations they're having and what they're trying to build, especially as an entertainment company, is related. So I feel like they're working more um, than ever before. I think it's more of a challenge to, the, to directors, managers, and executives to, to, to get, how do, you har how do you embrace that, the reality of that, and make sure that the deliverables and the results 
are optimized. And that's where the challenge comes. It's, it's, much more, it's much easier to be like, well, you were in the office and you delivered this and you were in this meeting and you said that. Okay, well, what impact did, did a, uh, the right person they met at a uh, new music concert happen and now all of a sudden that artist became part of our label and now we're distributing that music and it's like, what if that person wasn't there and they were in the office grinding away? And, I, and, I, you know, and there's so many of those. Have you always had that point of view? Um, you know, because it's very refreshing. If you're like, a, you're recruiting now is off the chart. Like people watching, they're like, I want to go work for this guy. As you know me, uh, I'm a very results oriented person. Um, I'm pretty um, loose and creative about my own self because I think about this business 24 seven. So there are, I take a lot of mental health days, not that I'm not working, but I work from home, right? Um, a lot of time, a lot of times there's Fridays where I'm in the office an hour or two. Uh, I'm still probably pulling 13, 14 hours worth of work, but I'm doing it in different places. Um, that's always been the case. It's, it's the way it works for me. So not that I'm trying to extrapolate that out over, over other people, but I'm trying to be as open-minded about it as absolutely possible. And here's the other thing is, if that is the reality of the way, uh, um, if, if a greater preponderance of the people under 30 years old put quality of life and flexibility at the forefront of that, so do you want to just fight that fight? Do you want to be running uphill all the time? Or do you want to run downhill and, and, and turn the page? And leverage like, it. And, and leverage it, right, and take advantage of it. And I think it's one of the reasons why we have such a good staff. When we started, I would tell my colleagues, I'm like, guys, don't show up on a weekend to be like, I was here on a weekend. If you literally have a project, there's a deadline, get it done. But balance is key, right. you know? Given everything that's happened in the world of media and entertainment, I couldn't help but ask him about the Me Too and Time's Up movements. You know, you do see a lot of companies and the usual suspects pop up. Complex has not really been one of those names that has come up. Do you, you know, do you have good non-disclosure agreements or is that legitimately oh. not a part of your culture? And first of all, if, if, you're, if you're policing that through NDAs, then you have a bigger problem than you think, number one. Because it's not about policing that, it's about creating culture where people feel comfortable. Um, you can't make it perfect all the time. You know, we, we, we've discussed this uh, directly and indirectly over the years. I mean, you know, the whole nature of what Complex is, even the tone of all of our content is very inclusive. You know, uh, we, we, we uncover um, and tell stories about really cool things that a lot of people don't know. But instead of being like, ha ha, you should be afraid of us or make fun of you, it's always from a very discovery open, inclusive way uh, versus a lot of other youth media companies. There's a lot of other youth media companies that are very um, exclusive and very negative. We were very positive and very inclusive. The only way to create that type of content is to have a staff that actually feels the same way, right? So it's pervasive in every aspect of the business. So for us, I think it's one of the reasons why we are a very diverse company from a, a multicultural perspective, from a gender perspective. I mean, I believe, you know, we're a male-driven media company. I, I think we're approaching 40% uh, female staff. And that's across all facets of the business. My CFO is a woman, my general counsel is a woman, um, and, and we have lots of other players. I can just imagine any counsel working with you. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Thank God she came from uh, she came from Scripps, okay. and um, so fairly conservative organization. Fairly conservative, but but honestly, but from an entertainment place, so you have to be True. very creative, right? Yeah. So I'm uh, very creative uh, about a lot of things, and 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 it's 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 a lot of fun. But um, you know, it, 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 but getting back to the the, the the diversity, not just the female side, but I mean, if you really took a snapshot, you've walked through my office fifty times. If you think, if you went and did uh, uh, the makeup of, uh, of the top 20 markets from a Census Bureau perspective, we're probably the media company that mirrors that the most out there. And I think that's another reason where we don't, do, we don't hire by quotas. We don't hire by, uh, with, with, a, with an initiative other than creating the best in class youth culture content. And it's a very for us, by us model. And organically, we solve a lot of problems by doing it that way. Two-parter, do you think that the changes that we're seeing where women are saying enough's enough, and even men, like for us, frankly, like half of us are surprised when this stuff happens. The other half maybe like, you know, has... Surprised and skeleton. angered. I mean, yeah. I'm angered about it, to be really frank. Like, I mean, not just as a father of two daughters, but as a guy who my whole life and this whole business, and you, you, we've talked about pride and, and what we're proud of. 
it's amazing what we've accomplished as a business, but the people that we've put on that would not normally get chances, whether it's um, for not the right education, not the right resume, didn't come from the right place, not a very polished person, doesn't have that experience. Like, you know, the cast of characters um, that, that we've given opportunities to, and I don't just mean low level, I mean big, big opportunities and fed uh, all that, that is the thing that I'm most proud of. And, and that is a big thing for me. I have a chip on my shoulder about where I grew up. I came from, I'm a public school kid from Brooklyn who um, normally wouldn't have gotten a lot of opportunities. And the, the opportunities that I've been given, I have to make sure that I amplify those and give them to a lot more people. And that's, that's part of my job, by definition, in my book. Yeah, I would say if you had to look at everybody that works at Watch Mojo, there's a part of them that's like an underdog. There's a part of them that that's was right. like they were overlooked. So I, I, I don't I, like just one chip. I prefer <laughs> one, one on each shoulder. So I want to talk a little bit about family and your daughters, something we have in common. We both have two daughters. But I do want to put you on the spot because um, when it comes to complex, you do cover a lot of artists who you could say, you know, they're... Pr mature in nature. Mature in nature. And some of them would probably represent women in music videos or whatever that some people would say, well, that kind of further lends to the situation that has bubbled up over right. centuries. How do you balance that? Where you're like, you probably do, I can s sincerely see you probably want to address that and change that, but you also don't want to tune well, out to your audience. Well, I mean, first of all, you have to remember something. We don't look to develop salacious content. We will cover that if that's news and it's going on in the genres that we're interested in. I don't know if you've noticed, but the content that we develop is not salacious by nature. Whether it shows like the blueprint um, or uh, sneaker shopping uh, or hot ones, these are not negative they're not dark they're not brooding they're not definitely not salacious they're not filled with curses and deme and it's very positive and very fun and that's one of the reasons i think we've been successful so the content that we develop ourselves is very positive um we we have to cover things that go on in music and entertainment and and gaming and and uh, and all of, and some of them are negative and some of them are very mature in nature young people are, are interested in that that is part of growing up you get exposed to that and you choose to what degree you embrace it or don't embrace it you don't mirror those things my job is not to shield and protect my kids and put them in a bubble and be a helicopter parent my job is to 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 make a outrageously strong foundation so that these women that I'm raising to be infinitely smarter, have a stronger thought process and a better um, constitution than I ever had um, so that they can be exposed to all of that and decide what they want to take from anything. It is not about shielding anything. And I'm not trying to get up on a soapbox, but um, I think it's a really lame excuse to, to point a finger at something else that's a problem or uh, it's your fault my kid behaves badly. I think that's a bunch of shit. So you have two daughters, 10 and 8 now, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. How do you balance, as a successful uh, business person, successful father, how do you balance giving Hopefully them... successful Hopefully. father. Yeah, no, but I mean, I, I follow you on, you know, we're connected on Facebook, so I kind of feel like I've seen them grow up. That's and right. You're giving them a lot of experiences and, you know, whether it's the trips or whatnot. How do you balance spoiling your kids with giving them, you know, the things that you want to give them to make well, them happy. Well, how you spoil them is important, right? I mean, um, I will tell you, you know, uh, I, I didn't get a whole lot as a kid. Um, I had to go buy a lot of my own things and create all my own opportunities and create my own experiences. Um, so th th what's funny is because of that, the, na the, 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 the human nature in me would be to spoil the living crap out of my kids, right? Because it's not what I had. So I, went the, I want to go the other way and make sure that they have the exact opposite experience. Um, that would be the wrong thing. You don't take the pendulum on one side and swing it all the way over there. You find the middle. And so how you spoil them is the thing. I want to spoil the hell out of my kids from an exposure perspective, from an experience perspective. That is tremendously important for me. Um, it's something I didn't have. And I mean, I, you know... I'm hardly going to call myself mature now, but I didn't mature a lot. Um, you mature a lot faster when you start getting exposed to things, right? Different cultures, um, different classes, how people, other people live, how they make their money, uh, the, the problems they all have. Um, and then that also drives a lot of empathy and respect. 
which I think is tremendously important and lacking in this. So what we've concentrated on, we actually stopped doing presents for our kids for birthdays, um, for uh, anniversaries, for everything for, uh, as our family. So um, what we do is we do trips and we go, what do you want to do? We don't do parties for, for the kids. The kids go, all right, my daughter was, was just her 10th birthday and um, she had a soccer tournament down in Disney and I'm like, what do you want to do for your 10th birthday? And she's like, I want to stay in Disney and I want to go swim with the dolphins because she loves animals and she loves being connected to nature. Um, she also works on a horse farm as well. And um, so for us, I was like, that is a great use of money because it's an event we do as a family. We, it, 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 we spend more time together. It is about the experience and the money that is spent is the memory and the feeling and, and the, the learnings that come from it, not the material good that will end up in a closet with dust on it very quickly. And it's not perfect, but I will tell you um, it's a great thing. And then the flip side of that, and I referenced it quickly, is you know, um, my older daughter started working a couple of years ago at this horse farm where uh, they, do pony, they, they provide the horses that do pony rides at one of the farms near my beach house. And uh, my, my daughter has to get up. I have to drop her off at the, at the horse farm. They have to clean the horses. They have to bring the horses to the, to the uh, festival, the farm, and then sell the pony rides, clean up the poop, take the horses back at the end of the day, clean the horses again. Um, and she makes about 120 bucks, 150 bucks a day. And that is the money that she then goes and uses to buy her own Google Chromebook. Her own, and by the way, yes, that we happen to be in here, so it worked out very nicely. But um, is uh, that's an amazing thing for a ten-year-old? I believe it when you say you work two four seven or think about your your job two four seven. But then you come home. A successful household is a is a balanced yes. partnership. Your wife, how does she fit in this in your crazy universe? She doesn't care if you have a call with Tim Armstrong or whatever. You know, the <laughs> no, girl, she doesn't. That's what I'm saying. No, she doesn't. Um, and and that's the that's the good part, right? Um, uh, you know, we. I will tell you, um, the greatest thing in the world was the opportunity. Like when we got married, and then um, got pregnant right after, we, and and and, and we we're lucky enough to have kids very quickly. Um, you know, we had talked about before we even got married that, um, and this was well before a lot of um, money occurred, right? Uh, we were on the path, but it was well before. And uh, not this is not a criticism of anybody, but you know, if you have the opportunity to make a choice to have not have somebody else raise your child, I think that's a big choice. And we made that choice. My wife gave up her career. So your spouse is your partner at home. You obviously have partners at work. How would they describe working with Rich as, as like, you know, uh, the executive team? I'm going to ask you afterwards about uh, your team, your staff. But first, the guys who are in that boardroom with you. I, I think a lot of them, um, you know, I am who I am, right? I'm not, I don't really change. Uh, you, you've seen me through all the iterations, and um, I, I don't really have a big filter on things. And my, my viewpoint is, is uh, you should be who you are in, in, in professional and personal um, you can't be one type of man and another type of CEO, in my viewpoint. Um, I think you have to be who you are. And I will always put respect and empathy first. Uh, I, and, you know, I am a lot. I have very high expectations of myself. And then I have very high, still very high expectations of other people. But I will always expect a lot more out of myself to be able to make up for everybody else. Um, if there is a shortcoming or an opportunity or a lack of vision or a lack of ambition or lack of capabilities or no matter what, um, uh, you know, I'm this weird combination of insane ambition with pragmatism, discipline, and, and, and a measured approach. Um, it, it's, it's maddening for me, but it's been very good for my family and it's been very good for the business. And, you know, I'm a little crazy. I'm a little loud. Uh, and I will always push people to get better, so it's a little exhausting. But um, you know, you can't win in this in this arena that we play in. I, I think any business sector right now changes and iterates so fast, and then media is just compounding effect of that. So you know, there is no perfect anything, and the, and the point of diminishing returns is very fast. So instead of being first or best, I want to be early and better, a, be a combination of that. So I push people every single day for that, and I'm sure they want to kill me for it, but it's why we sit where we sit. 
What would your staff say, the guys who report to you? What's the worst thing they would say about you and what's the best thing they'd say about you? Um, I, uh, I would hope they would say that I'm tremendously supportive. Um, I give people a lot of opportunity. I give them a lot of leeway also. I, exp I don't tell people, I try not to be directive oriented, right? I try and give people the opportunity to be like, here's what we're trying to achieve from an objective perspective. Here's directionally how I think we should go about it. What is you, how do you get the specifics in order to get there? Because you're more of the vertical expert than I am. And that's, that, that's a part of that respect and empathy to give people the opportunity to do it their way. Um, I do have very high expectations. I set very aggressive goals, short and long term. Um, I expect us to win. And, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've said this to you before that the media space is very ambiguous. So ambiguity, it, there's two sides of ambiguity. Weak people use ambiguity as an excuse to fail. Strong people go, there's a million different ways to win and I'm going to take advantage of that ambiguity. The problem is that's not 50-50, it's about 85-15. And I try and be in the 15 all the time with my team. And it's hard, but, but that's, I have very high expectations. When you push yourself and you push others, we rarely talk about it and we do so more and more. Your mental state of mind comes up. And when Ian Schaefer decided to resign or walk away, you know, on, on Twitter you posted a couple comments and I reached out to you, you know, talked about stress. I, God knows I went through a period where I had my own issues, but yep. let's talk about that a little bit. Like, how do you balance, frankly, not losing your mind and staying sane? Um, you know, I, I would lie if I said that I don't. I mean, you do. You lose your mind. You, like I was talking about before with mental health days, um, sometimes just taking a break, taking a breath, um, thinking about it differently from a fresh perspective, um, trying not to get aggravated. Um, I have struggled with that. It is a very difficult thing. Um, you know, it comes down to true foundational confidence that in the, at the end of the day, you will make the right decision more so than not, not 100% of the time, but more so than not. And then you will work harder on an executional basis, personally and professionally, in order to fix it. And this way you will end up ahead of other people. And that's how you take a breath and relax. Um, because it is overwhelming. The inputs, the data, the challenges, um, personal, professional, um, I mean, think about just every day just operating a business and all the things that people have no idea about. It isn't about just setting strategy and then making sure people do their job. All the legal crap, all of the, um, you know, cease and desists and um, uh, turnover and, uh, you know, uh, challenges from an investor when you want to sell your business. Do you want to, like, what's the right thing? How much do you take? Do you take money? Do you sell? Do you not sell? Do you go, like, go it on your own? How much is control worth? What does governance look like? I mean, you know, you can get, you can, you can drown. You can drown. Um, you have to go, what's important? What, out of this fire hose of choices, what are the two or three things that are most important on a sequencing basis? And then you attack it in that way. And, um, and, and uh, but believe me, I'm not good at it. I'm just a lot better at it than I used to be. I wasn't going to bring this up, but Rich did. So when I met him in June of 2010, we were in our fifth year of operations and racked up nearly $800,000 in losses. Not a huge sum by New York standards, but a sizable fortune up in Montreal. And if you're wondering, I didn't have $800,000 when I started the biz, so I was in debt and looking for strategic partners. You mentioned all these items, ultimately they come about, they boil down to decisions. That's right. Some of the best deals are the ones you don't make. Is there a most. deal? Most. Is, is there a deal that you look back and you say, man, I'm glad we didn't pursue that? Um, you can name names if you, you know, want. It's you know, it's kind of funny. I, 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 I'm smiling because there's, it's a long list. Um, uh, let me say two things. Number one, I'm going to say it's one of the deals that still pisses me off that we were not able to get, and that's you and I trying to figure something out. Because we've been talk, we've talked, not just as, as friends, but what's nice is you're the only person that, honestly, you're the only person that I've ever spoken to about trying to acquire their company and, or working out something uh, where it didn't work out. Um, but I could argue that our relationship became better after that, like, because it was no harm, no foul, but it was truly no harm, no foul. Uh, it doesn't, oh, it isn't always like that. Um, look, we had a lot of people that came after our business over a lot of different, a lot of different periods of time. Um, we didn't make decisions, we, we never make decisions exclusively around money. That's the key. 
I'm not, I, I notice I said exclusively, not, your know, money is a very important p component. If you have to uh, keep a contract or a, a legal document out and keep going back to what you have to deliver to somebody in a partnership, then, then you're in the wrong place. If you, you, you know, that is a necessary evil that should go in the drawer and never come out again, and never get referenced again. Um, you should be able to work through things. And in this world, knowing that whatever you decide, you're probably gonna have to change in six to nine months and continue to change. That's how we make decisions. And the people that seemingly would have made sense for us to either acquire or be acquired by, um, when you dig a little deeper, two or three levels down and think about the long term, um, it wasn't the right personality mix for us. You guys moved eventually to the Time and Life building. Yep. Well, we moved again. You moved again. Where yes. are you now? We're now in the old Yahoo space um, right next to Snapchat on wow. 43rd, between so 7th and 8th. The symbolism runs deep. It's amazing. But specifically when you moved into the Time and Life building, that's when Mad Men was at the peak of that's popularity. Right. That's right. What was your thought, honestly, that day when you move in? Is it kind well, of Well, ironically, we moved into the Time Life building and we moved into the 35th floor. The 35th floor was previously occupied, not, uh, not directly, but like of years before that, by Lehman Brothers. Ooh. So there's lots of symbolism wow. there, by the way. Like it's, uh, and not so positive, obviously. I don't like to dance on the devil, uh, on the grave of old media, um, like the way a lot of people do. Um, I'm critical of them from a strategic perspective, but I don't, I, I don't think that's something to revel in because a lot of people have lost their jobs. They lost a lot of people's money and, and it provides less opportunities. And I believe that brands, it, great brands that get created, if you're, not, if you're willing to not allow yourself to be defined by the distribution platform, they can continue to live on and thrive. A lot of people have killed great brands by allowing themselves to be defined by their old business models and or distribution platforms. And you know, there's people doing that right now. There's people that have done that and then they continue to do the same. It's, I'm not questioning the brand value. I'm questioning the um, insanely moronic and inane approach to um, the business models behind it. Um, that's the way I look at it. Speaking of generations from one to another, I know your father was a very big influence on you. Yep. What's the biggest thing he taught you or the traits that he kind of instilled in you? And as you get older, do you feel you're becoming like he was? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, both good and bad. Um, look, um, I'll tell you a quick, a quick, there's so many stories about my dad, but um, you know, my dad, not a very educated guy, um, signed up, fought in the Korean War, um, was uh, a UPS driver, uh, delivered packages uh, in my neighborhood. Um, so old school, hardcore working, everything is, everything was very linear for my father. So I don't share that with him. Um, but uh, he pushed me very, very hard. His expectations of me were through the roof. Uh, Cause he did not, he would say, he was like, here's the expectations. Cause I know you have the capabilities, but on top of it, I, I, you, you cannot, I do not want you to have the life that I've had and the struggles that I've had and, and that your grandparents had. And, and that's just not gonna happen. And uh, it wasn't an option for me. So my father, up until I was about 16 years old, I thought my name is, what are you a fucking moron, right? Um, and I'm not joking, like literally, like he probably said that to me more than my own name uh, um, because that was what he expected. And, and that could be everything from getting a 99 on a math test instead of 100, all the way to um, buying an Adidas sweatshirt with a logo and spending three times what the plain sweatshirt would cost, right? Um, there's lots of stories around that. But that instilled a lot for me in that my father, uh, I wrote a little post when, when he passed away in that, you know, like my father was not a fancy guy. Um, he wasn't that smart, but he was crafty. He wasn't, he didn't have a lot of money, but he was incredibly generous. And at the end of the day, for my father, there was no cheating. There was no shortcuts. There's no bullshit. You do everything the right way, whether or not somebody's looking. And it, that's the, how you treat people. That's how you build a business. That's how you, no matter what you're doing, you do it the right way. And I'd like to think that, you know, it's probably made my life a little harder, but it's, that's something that, to me, that's me carrying the torch on his behalf. I'm trying not to get emotional. I know. Um, is, but that's me carrying his, that torch. 
and doing it the right way, not just for me and my family, um, but, uh, but the respect and empathy that you give to everybody in, in doing it that way. And that, that's a big thing for me. I, I read that post when you posted it, and I think a lot of people you know, thought it was a very, very uh, nice thing to say. Um, so you mentioned your grandparents. Obviously, America is a country of immigrants. And yep. What do you think about the current political environment? environment? <laughs> like, uh, well, as uh, um, uh, you know, somebody who has not my, my a lot of my family has not been here a long time, right? Uh, you know, I'm half Swedish, half Italian. Um, both came over. Uh, both big families, and my parents were. were uh, my father was significantly older. My mom is significantly older than I am. Um, so a very old school approach. I know how hard they, both of those sides of my family worked. Um, and I, I, it is amazing to me, the, but part of not, that is not, the thing that is not part of the vernacular and the, and, the, and, the, and the conversation is how hard immigrants work here. And I don't just mean hours. I mean the choices they make. You know, the thing that is amazing and that is, uh, is baffling to me, and I, I see it all the time, and I'm not trying to criticize some of my friends and what they, the, you know, but they make a lot more choices for themselves than they make for their kids. Um, you know, one of the reasons why an entire generation of immigrants now kind of uh, run and impact this country is because they put their kids and the opportunities for those kids above anything for themselves, ever. And I know both of my parents did that for me. And I, and I know that, you know, it is amazing what uh, a lot of Asian American communities do for their children. It is amazing what a lot, all the old communities do. Um, you know, parents, single moms working two jobs just so their kid can actually play sports rather than having to work. And, you know, I don't think that gets talked about enough because that makes it real. And it's not part of the talking points from the right. And it's not... It, it's and it and it and 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 don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the left is right on this either. But like to me, it's always about the people and about the opportunities and the foundation of this country. And you know, when you make it real and talk about and expose people to the reality, not the numbers and statistics, but what people do and and how many of them have given up all of that. And that if you give somebody an opportunity to do that as a parent, I actually believe that a lot of immigrants will make better choices for their kids than a lot of people that are here. You describe yourself as the luckiest person in the world. In what sense? Many. Um, you know, I, 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 can, I can reference it. I've been very lucky to um, have a lot of great people in my life. Um, you know, I was lucky in that uh, I went to a public school that uh, had a great program and I had teachers and principals and vice principals that always looked to me specifically and to put me in better situations um you know that that's that's an aberration of aberrations um it, it, all these things like i got very i've gotten very lucky when i was a kid um i shouldn't have probably had the opportunity to break out of where i broke out of people that i've met in my life have always been very kind to me my friends um i've had a lot of lifelong friends um my wife is amazing. Her family is amazing. My in-laws, my parents, um, good and bad, were, but, but, but it's amazing what they instilled. Um, and honestly, also, the opportunities on a professional basis. I thank God I came along at the time I did come along in one way. Because if I had been younger, and, uh, and, and, or older, I should say, but come along, I don't. I think the, my approach, my brass, brashness, my openness, and the way I approach things, I, I, I like. I came along at the right time because it was that it was right when people were open to that. Instead of being the well, here's the white guy with the white shirt and the blue suit and the yellow tie, and you got to fit the mold and you got to say it the right way and you got to do it that way. Like, I don't know if I would have been successful um, before. Uh, I think you know you, you have to have, get lucky on a context basis, and and then you get lucky. You know, I have met a lot of people through business. I don't look at them as business friends. I have a lot of people that I know. Like, look, even the conversations. You know, you share a lot of information with me, and I share a lot of information with you, without any holdback, knowing that I'm not looking to screw you over, and you're and vice versa, and I'm lucky to have. 
uh, not boatloads of them, but I have a lot of people that I, I feel I have that level of relationship with, and I don't think most people do. And and that's I mean it's all the whole ball of wax, really. I mean I am a very lucky guy. Final question: In three years, five years, ten years, whatever timeline in the future, where what do you see complex? Where do you see it going? Where would you like it to go? You know, um, I kind of alluded to it before. Um, you know, right now uh, we're, we're by default looked at as a um, a premier digital publisher, right? Um, I don't look at us as that at all. I think the important thing that I think about is right now we are a br the, the ultimate youth culture brand that creates the best content in the world, platform agnostic, that right now right now disproportionately distributes that content digitally, but the spokes. Our distribution and our revenue streams will be more diversified than anyone has ever seen before on a multi-brand basis and that the, the power of the brand and the audience on a cumulative basis will be unlike what anybody's ever seen. We will just get there very differently than anybody, the way anybody's been constructed before. That to me is where we're going to be and that will be in there in three to f with three years. You know, you're a very classy guy, and they say people invest in brands. <laughs> I understand why brands like Verizon and Hearst invest in you. I really, you have the right outlook, and I think as an entrepreneur, when I look at, you know, people that aren't in it for like the quick overnight success, people who build sustainable businesses and organizations. And, and by the way, I'm gonna I, that that's a really interesting point, and something I didn't say earlier. That was a big part of the Verizon Hearst thing. It wasn't just big stable companies with with big um, backing, right? It was the people there really not just believed in our, my vision and our vision, the way they went about it, it was real. And um, they want to help and they um, wanted to invest. And, and rather than had to or looked at it as just like, well, oh, this guy, will, that's two more points on EBITDA, right? Like that's not the way, that's not the relationship. And it's, um, I, 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 I think a lot of big companies get a bad rap sometimes. If you let them, you might have a bad relationship, but it's also, relationships are two-way streets. It's as much up to me to, to get what I need out of them as it is for them to get what they need out of me. And that's my responsibility. I actually think a lot of big companies get a bad rap, personally. Thank you, Rich. Thank you.